Hello friends, this is Jay Hendricks with Powerful Thought Online. Today, as a fellow student with you, I wanted to talk about repentance. What is repentance? So, before I go into repentance, I wanted to recap the last video, uh, What is Faith and Truth? And just remind you that these are all my interpretations, that uh, these exp explanations are should not be taken as the truth and if they resonate with you then that's an interesting clue so here we go um, first I want to recap I'm just gonna make some statements that will hopefully recap the last video truth is that which cannot be eliminated that which cannot be eliminated the kingdom of heaven is the place where no part of any relationship can be eliminated. Uh, Christ is the state of being where no thing can be eliminated, or nothing can be eliminated. And you can read that in two different ways. Nothing can be eliminated, or nothing itself, nothing can be eliminated. A resurrected body is composed entirely of that which cannot be eliminated and is therefore indestructible and immortal. Truth is found primarily with four processes or four things. Fact, interpretation, faith, and performance. Fact, interpretation, faith, and performance. Science is tied to fact Art is tied to interpretation. You could also say, I'll go back, science is tied to fact. You could also say, uh, traditional occultism is tied to fact. It would be more subjective fact. Looking at your subjectivity objectively. Um, art is tied to interpretation. I could also say that philosophy is tied to that as well. Philosophy would be with art. I kind of consider philosophy to be the art of thinking and wisdom. Something like that. Faith is tied to belief. Uh, religion. And performance is tied to practical expression. <clears throat> so the process of science helps eliminate all changing variables to find unchanging objective fact. The process of art helps eliminate all changing surface interpretations to see unchanging resonant interpretations. The process of faith eliminates all false unstable beliefs and integrates unchanging stable beliefs. The process of performance eliminates all inconsistent, disaffecting actions, disaffecting actions, and builds stable, blessing actions. <clears throat> so, once truth is found, it is known. Knowledge is not information or recalling information. Knowledge is knowing truth in the moment. Knowing truth in the moment. And wisdom and love is behaving from that knowing. So as you practice faith in whatever you choose, devoted action, um, to build in beliefs, as you practice faith, knowledge increases, which means... Your ability to stay in your knowing increases, and then you're able to, and wisdom and love would be the behavior that comes from that knowing, when you're in that knowing. Alright, so the product of science, the processes of science, the product, product of science is fact, the product of art is interpretation. The product of faith is belief, 
and the product of performance is action. All right. So, and I'll just restate. So truth is known in the moment. And the behavior from knowing is wisdom and love. Now I want to distinguish more between belief and faith. <clears throat> faith is a process and belief is an unconscious judgment, let's say. So faith is a process, belief is an unconscious judgment. It's more like a thing, let's say. So belief is the product of faith. Beliefs are unconscious foundations to our thoughts, emotions, and actions. The process of faith is consciously building in unconscious beliefs through devoted action. And the process of faith can be conscious or can be exercised toward anything, really. Uh, and people do it all the time. They perform devoted actions toward what they want to believe. And whether that's true or false, wh whether those beliefs they build in are true or false, will manifest in their behavior. Okay. <clears throat> so, if you can have faith in anything and it is a process, then faith in Christ is devoted action toward developing unconscious beliefs in Christ. And whatever we unconsciously believe will unconsciously affect behavior, emotion, and thought. So if believing in Christ leads to the best way of living, if that's the case, then faith in Christ is the process to build in that way of living into, into your unconscious. Christ becomes your nature if you have faith in Christ. You literally take on his name or quality upon you. And you let him morph your nature into your best self. Okay. So faith is tied to nature. It, it changes your unconscious. Now, some examples of daily practice of faith in Christ are studying the words and teachings of Jesus Christ. Particularly, I love the Sermon on the Mount. Um, that's Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And it's in more of the Gospels, but Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, I think that sermon encapsulates uh, his purpose and what he was actually doing. And then, I, you know, I've personally listened to the Sermon on the Mount on audio tape, on audio CD. I've listened to it so many times, and every time I listen to it, I get more from it. And it really is a, it seems very paradoxical when you're listening to it, but as you try to understand and as you practice uh, these things in your daily life, at work, in your family, you start to understand little by little what Christ was talking about. And it really elevates your consciousness and aligns you to divinity. That's what I believe. And... It has helped me uh, stay more and more in my knowing and to act from that knowing and wisdom and love. So, studying the words and teachings of Jesus Christ is part of the practice of faith. Trying out the teachings of Christ in daily living and in service to others and keeping his commandments and praying to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, now, a lot of people have issues with prayer, but some don't. I really enjoy prayer. 
And prayer is a humbling action, ritual, you could say. Prayer is a humbling action, a ritual, that develops a personal relationship with God the Father. A personal relationship. So I say that God is personal because personality encapsulates every subtlety of being that impersonality cannot. It encapsulates every subtlety of being that impersonality cannot. A deeper and more subtle connection to a personal God is made through prayer. Impersonality toward God keeps him vague, undifferentiated, meaningless, and tepid. And if you have that subjective um, impersonality toward God, that'll also affect everything else. It'll keep everything vague, undifferentiated, meaningless, and tepid. So any impersonality toward God is a subjective veil over our own minds in a mostly unconscious effort to avoid accountability and responsibility to Him. Now some people may, when they say to, when they hear someone say to pray and they actually pray, sometimes they feel dumb or they feel, what am I doing? This is so, you know, stupid. But really what that is, is your ego talking and it's the pride that's resting in your being that you don't really see most of the time. If you have a problem with prayer, that could be a very interesting clue as to where the pride in you is hiding. And as you pray more and more, and you start to enjoy it, then this ego that gets in the way and says, this is kind of stupid to do, will slowly drop away and naturally help you become your authentic self, your Christ-like self. So just to recap of the recap, we have discussed beliefs as unconscious structures underlying our egos. Unconscious structures. We have discussed how beliefs affect our thinking, feeling, and behavior naturally and unconsciously. We have discussed how faith is a process to build in beliefs through devoted action. We have discussed how faith can be directed toward anything. So, you know, a uh, Wall Street guy has built up beliefs based on his devoted action in the stock market, let's say. Or anything else. A sports fan has devoted himself to a team and a sport and so he his faith has grown in the sport anything can apply to faith but um, but we've also discussed how faith in Christ from our unique person or sorry we have discussed how faith in Christ is the process of devoted action to build in belief beliefs to naturally think, feel, and behave like Christ from our unique perspectives. We have discussed how prayer, scripture study, and service are parts of the process of faith. And there's many more. You can always, you should always keep it simple at first, and then as that gets not boring, but it's like lifting weights. Once you feel that you can move on to more reps, you can add more things to your practice or refine your faith, faithful practice. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. We have discussed how God is our Father who has a personality. And how personality encapsulates every subtlety of being. And how 
and personality of God is a vague and subjective veil over our minds to avoid a clarifying relationship with God. Clarifying, just like if you have a relationship with a family member or a significant other or a friend, the more time you spend with them, the more clarifying your relationship becomes. And we've discussed how this subjective, impersonal, vague veil hides us from our accountability and responsibility to God. Okay? So that was a long introduction. So now on to the principle, the next principle of the gospel, which is repentance. So repentance builds on the process of faith. As we build in these new unconscious beliefs through devoted action, our way of thinking, feeling, and behaving changes naturally. We begin to see where we have wronged others, where, where we wrong others now, and what state our life is in. We begin to see more clearly the quality of our effect on others, this is where we move into the process of performance, where we begin to see the weak spots in our thinking, feeling, and action. We see the weak spots where we're disaffecting others. We begin to make amends to people we have wronged. We fix one thing and another thing little by little. We ask for forgiveness from God, others, and just as importantly, we ask forgiveness from ourselves. Forgiveness is making restitution and moving on. Forgiveness is one of the major keys to living in flow. If you've studied flow, and I, I want to go more into flow, the flow state. Forgiveness is key to this. If mistakes are made, even minor ones, we do our best to fix them, learn from them, adjust, and move on in our flow. Forgiveness makes it so that we are not constantly stuck in wondering, daydreaming, rationalizing, and judging, etc. It keeps us flowing. Forgiveness. You know, an example of that would be if there's a basketball player and he keeps judging his performance, he's going to keep getting stuck and not letting go and making a good move or a good play. Any mis if, you've, if you've found athletes or performers who they make mistakes on stage or in a game, uh, they'll actually adjust so well to that that it doesn't look like a mistake and keep going. And they use the mistake and learn from it in the moment and keep going. And it's it's... Not that they're thinking, it's part of intuition at that point, and instinct. Repentance is the process of stripping away the weak parts of the ego. It naturally humbles you little by little. Your heart becomes soft and pliable, and able to flow through resistance whether that's flow through resistance, process through resistance better, avoid resistance, depends on the situation. Praying and asking the Father for a remission of sins daily will make the ego smaller and smaller until it fits into its proper place in reality. And I'll say that again. Praying and asking the Father for a remission of sins daily will make the ego smaller and smaller until it fits into its proper place in reality. That, uh, when you pray, if you include the element at some point as you're praying to ask for remission of your sins, that really solidifies, for me, that solidifies the practice of prayer. And the feeling and the clarity and the stability you get after you've asked for a remission of sins and you really believe 
that God can do that, the clarity and the flow that you get after that, the stability is very real and very um, useful in the daily life. And a daily practice of that is very effective and very good. So, you begin to see that God is the one molding your life and lending you his power to transform you. He withdraws his power when pride rears its ugly head. And you can be cut off from divinity, or cursed, as the scriptures say, to be cut off from divinity. Cursed people can be very competent in their pride. They can have very refined egos. They can, have, they can be powerful. But that power is misused and directed toward leeching vitality from others to keep the prideful ego alive. So you go from, if you're cut off from God, you can go from a state of serving others, providing vitality, to leeching vitality off of others to keep your prideful ego alive. Um, for instance, I've been harsh to some who comment on here. I've been fairly harsh to some. And that may be the wrong thing to do. My reasoning in the past has been that a bruised ego is more likely to humble themselves than a prideful ego who takes energy from others to make their egos larger. But who am I to bruise an ego? So that is that could be, or that is, pride rising up in me. Um, I've since realized that it may be pride in me that made me do, that made me be harsh to some people on here. I've had this problem in some of my personal relationships as well, being too harsh, not being polite enough. And so I've realized that more politeness is my duty and that the wrath of God is left to the Father. Some instances um, I have felt I've let go and the truth has come out through me and it was harsh. But I should not confuse that with the times when perhaps I was wanting to one-up people, let's say. So, um, now I will attempt to act out this change of heart because I have noticed it and others have helped me notice it. And I'll... Um, try to act out this change of heart by making restitution as best as I can and focusing on uh, refining my faithful practice and, and changing my behaviors and trying to do that. And my behavior and thinking and feeling will change over time according to the will of God. This all to me is the process of repentance. It is an extension of the process of faith and how that process changes us over time. Once we get into the rhythm of humbling ourselves in the face of egoic reactions, we don't have to be perfect, of course. Just once we get into the familiar um, habit of surrendering when we've wronged and trying to make restitution, um, humbling ourselves, um, and changing our ways to clarify our relationship with God, we are ready to move on to the next principle of the gospel, which is baptism. And I'll cover baptism in my next video in this series. And then I'm working on my notes for Revelation chapter 7, so I'll continue with that series. I have a lot of other series that I haven't worked on lately, but... I plan on working on them little by little, and so please stick with me, and thank you for watching. I'm Jay Hendricks. This is Powerful Thought Online. Please like and subscribe, and share if you can. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.